morning. My name is uh, Sally Wenzel. I'm an assistant professor of medicine at National Jewish in Denver, Colorado. The topic for my talk is measuring the success of asthma control. Over the next 15 minutes or so, I would like to specifically address the indications for objective measures of respiratory function in the diagnosis and management of reversible obstructive airways disease. Specifically, I would like to emphasize when relatively simple and inexpensive tests are adequate and what situations may arise when more expensive and complicated evaluations are necessary, usually under the guidance of an asthma specialist. Let me begin by quoting uh, a proverb of unknown authorship, which has been emphasized to me continuously from the beginning of my pul pulmonary fellowship. And that is, all that wheezes is not asthma, and all that is asthma does not wheeze. Subjective measurements alone are not often not adequate for the diagnosis and management of asthma. Clinical presentation uh, can be very confusing at times. There are too many times uh, when one can be fooled by the clinical presentation, both from the perspective of wheezing without asthma and asthma without wheezing. For example, wheezing can be heard in fixed obstructive airways disease such as COPD, in upper airway obstruction, secondary to a laryngeal tumor or vocal cord dysfunction, and wheezing can even be voluntarily induced. Uh, in addition, asthma, which presents with very severe airflow limitation, uh, perhaps in status asthmaticus, will often not present with wheezing because the airflow is so low that wheezing cannot be produced. In addition, wheezing is often not heard in a form of asthma called cough variant asthma. Specifically then, there is a significant need for objective measures of respiratory function, both at diagnosis and at follow-up. I would now like to suggest the evaluations for both, with the idea that this need not be a complicated affair if proper measures are obtained at proper times by proper people. Let me begin with the subjective, uh, uh, with the simple objective measures of pulmonary function, which one would often use in the initial early evaluation of an asthma patient. For this purpose, I would like to use examples to illustrate my various points. For the first scenario, let's look at two particular possibilities, either of which may be seen commonly in a clinical practice. A patient presents to you with cough and or a history of intermittent shortness of breath, perhaps following uh, exercise, uh, over a short period of time and not related uh, to any respiratory infection, any obvious respiratory infection. Um, or perhaps a patient comes to your office after having been seen in an emergency room with what has been billed as an acute asthma attack. No objective measures of pulmonary function have been obtained at this time. At the day of the visit to your office, the patient is asymptomatic and the physical examination is completely normal. Yet the history would suggest that asthma is indeed a possibility. Well, what should be done at this time? In this instance, the history for asthma is really fairly good and the duration of the symptoms is fairly short. I would suggest at this point that at minimum, a spirometry, preferably with a flow volume loop, both before and after bronchodilators, is an appropriate uh, approach to this patient. I think it's very important to measure spirometry both before and after bronchodilators, as one of the hallmarks of asthma is indeed its reversibility. I would also like to emphasize again that the early assessment through objective means is very critical to the evaluation of asthma. Once these tests are obtained, what numbers are the most helpful? What do we really need to look at? Unfortunately, computers that go along with the spirometers that are available today print out up to 100 different numbers. And clearly, this can become very confusing. However, there's really only four different numbers that should be evaluated following spirometry uh, uh, assessment. These are the FEV1, the FVC, the FEV1 to FVC ratio, and the response of the FEV1 to bronchodilators. The FEV1, or the sport forced expiratory volume in one second, is that amount of air which a patient blows out in the first sec second of an expiratory maneuver. It should be recorded as percent predicted because FEV1 will vary with age, size of the patient and sex. 
therefore it's important to uh, base it uh, as a percentage of predicted FEV1. FVC, or forced vital capacity, is the total amount of air that a patient can exhale over an expiratory maneuver. The ratio of FEV1 to FVC is an indication of the amount of obstruction present in the airways and should be based as an absolute percent, not as a percent predicted. And finally, as I've already mentioned, it's important to look at the response to bronchodilators. In the case of asthma, we would like to see an improvement of the FEV1 of between 10 to 15 percent following the administration of bronchodilators. These are some examples of some peak flow meters, which range in price from 10 to $40. And they're all of approximately the same quality. Obviously, just giving a patient a peak flow meter is not uh, enough. The patient must be taught how to use it. It's likely helpful to ascertain an optimal peak flow for that patient, and then to describe zones approximately 10 to 15 percent less than that and 20 to 25 percent less than that. It's been suggested that it's helpful to break these zones into the green, the yellow, and the red zone, similar to a traffic light. Obviously, when a patient is in the green zone, things are going very well and no changes in treatment are required. When a patient dips into the yellow zone, some caution must be entertained, and perhaps a patient needs to take some more uh, inhaled, inhaled treatments, perhaps a short course of steroids. When a patient reaches the red zone, clearly this is an indication to stop, to reassess, and probably to um, seek medical attention at that time. Now, the Aztec peak flow meter uh, has these red, red, yellow, and green zones built into it. However, certainly you can put these red, yellow, and green zones into any particular peak flow meter by just attaching a strip of tape to these various zones. I also recommend that my patients keep a peak flow diary, and by this, I mean recording their peak flows both before and after bronchodilators, both in the early morning hours and then in the evening hours, and certainly more often if they're having clinical symptoms. I think it's also important to uh, emphasize to the patient that they must use the same peak flow meter over time because there is some variability between peak flow meters themselves. Well, in conclusion, I'd like to present to you a scenario for objectively assessing and managing an asthma patient. Obviously, we've already heard about the initial office visit with a history consistent with asthma. At that point in time, I would obtain spirometry, both pre- and post-bronchodilator. If the FEV1 is decreased and the FEV1 and the FVC ratio decreased as well as an indicator of, of obstruction with a greater than 15% bronchodilator response, certainly one would treat the patient for asthma and follow the patient with peak flows. If, on the other hand, the FEV1 and the FVC are both decreased with a normal ratio and less than a 15% bronchodilator response, then one has to consider that other diseases may be playing a role in this uh, history of intermittent shortness of breath. Thirdly, the spirometry may be normal. Well, this may still be asthma. And at this point, one would need to consider the use of a methicoline challenge study to determine whether indeed the patient had asthma. If we treat the patient for asthma and we follow their peak flows and their symptoms and peak flows improve with our treatment, then I think yearly spirometry is certainly adequate uh, to uh, follow these patients. If, on the other hand, there's no change in symptoms and peak flows or spirometry, then at this point, the patient uh, requires more extensive, probably specialty-oriented uh, evaluation, including lung volumes, diffusing capacity, and methicoline challenge. If these are all consistent with asthma, that's the time when treatment should be aggressively increased. If it's not consistent with asthma, then you need to reevaluate. Thank you very much for your attention.